Hey, I'm Cameron, and thanks for checking out this message today. We're glad that you are here and would love to get connected with you and your family. One easy way you can do that is to text River Connect to 97000. You can also visit our website at theriverchurch.cc to learn more about us and some of our upcoming events. Lastly, if you would like to give to the River Church today, you can text the amount that you want to give to 84321, or you can head to our website and click the Give tab at the top of the page. Thanks again for joining us, and we hope you enjoy today's message. Um, I want to welcome all of you joining us online as well. Thank you for being here. If you have a Bible, Nehemiah chapter 9 is where we're going to be this morning. So Nehemiah, this wonderful book, chapter 9, and uh, just some incredible things we have seen through the book. I pray that it has been an encouragement to you. I have loved going through this book. We've only got a couple of weeks left of it. Can't believe it's almost done. Uh, so as a reminder, we left off a couple of weeks ago um, with uh, really is- the Israelites were praying and they were repenting before God. They had turned their hearts to the Lord and they were uh, really, we, we titled the message uh, a couple weeks ago, Faces to the Ground, because that's what they were. They, they were on their knees humbling themselves before God with their faces pressed to the, the ground in repentance and I- admitting their need. And uh, they were worshiping the Lord, and it was beautiful to see. And uh, we saw what that produced in them. That repentance produced in them happiness. It produced joy. And that is what all real repentance does. It produces happiness and joy. It's painful at the time, but man, the fruit of it is blessing. The fruit of it is joy and happiness. And so this morning... We, uh, we turn our attention from uh, really what the people are doing. We're going to see that here a little bit more this morning at the front. But then really most of the chapter has to do with what God has done. Okay, God's work. And so we're going to look at that here in just a minute. But let's pray once again and ask the Lord to speak to us. Okay, I'd encourage you to ask him uh, for yourself uh, that God would speak to you. Okay, so let's do that. Lord, we need you. We thank you. Uh, What a privilege it is to gather together this morning around your word. We ask for you to open your word to us. We ask for you to help us hear you. We need you, Lord. We thank you for being so faithful and uh, good. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I feel like I just need to say that the person doing announcements was my wife. (laughs) Just in case you were like, that's weird. He's asking for the number of the... Per- it's my wife, okay? Anyway, so... We'll just edit that out of the video. Okay, all right. I'm stupid. I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. Let me begin by asking a question this morning, and that's this. Does God actually work in our lives as people? Does he actually work in people's life? Like... Whatever you believe about this impacts your life, because you you think about it for just a moment. Does does the God of the universe get involved in your personal life? It's astonishing to even think about. Or does God just sort of, you know, keep the big stuff going, you know? Keep, Keep, you know, the planet spinning and the lights on, you know? I mean... Does God actually do stuff in the lives of normal people, people like you and me? Let's make it more personal. Uh, Is God working in your life today? Is he working in you in some way? Well, I think most of us would say, yes, God does actually get involved in our individual lives. He is actually working in my life, in your life, in our children, in our grandchildren, in our family. I mean, God is actually working in our lives. That's a real thing. But then we have to ask this question. If God does work in our lives, and we believe he does, what does that look like? Right? What, what would that, you know, if somebody were to come to you and say, hey, listen, I need you to help me with something. I, I just have a question. Does God work in our lives? And you would say, well, yes, he does. And they would say, well, how would I know if God's working in my life? Well, what would that look like? Right? What would you say? 
How would you describe it to somebody? Well, we've all heard the phrase, and maybe this is how you would describe it, the Lord works in mysterious ways. I don't know why I say it like that, but that's, how I, that's the only way I can say it, you know? He works in mysterious ways, you know? And I get what's happening there, right? People are trying to say, yeah, God works in our lives, but it's sort of like you can't really know what he's doing. He works in ways you can't predict. You can't really know. You can't explain. Now, I get where people are coming from in that, but is that what it is, really, that, that God is working, but we never see it, we never understand it, we never recognize it, we never know it? I don't think so. How would you answer the question? Does God work in people's lives, and what does it look like? Well, you know, when God's moving, there, you get goosebumps all over. You just feel them. Hair on the back of your neck stands up. Again, I don't know why I'm talking like this. Why am I? I got to stop that. Okay. When God is, you know, when God's working, well, things will just start to go smoothly. Have you said that? Please stop saying that. Don't do that. <laughs> You'll know it's God because problems just start to work themselves out. Everything starts to go okay. Everything's fine. He's working, you know. Things become easy. Oh, man. How do you describe it? How do you describe it when God's working? Let's narrow it down. What does it look like in an individual person's life when God is working in their life, in your life, in my life? Well, here's how I would answer it. I would say, uh, first and foremost, when God is working in your life, if God is working in your life today, this is true, uh, when he's working in you, there's a softening of your heart towards him. That's always the first thing. There's like this vertical thing that's happening. Between you and him, your heart begins to soften towards the Lord. You'll know God's working in your life when you start to you start directing your heart towards him. Something starts happening. Then I would also say uh, something else starts to happen. When God's working in your heart, there begins a, a hatred towards sin. There's, there's a hatred for things that keep you from him. That begins to, you begin to not want those things anymore. I would say when God's working in your life, there's a desire for holiness, for godliness. When God's working in a person's heart, they want to be holy. They want to do what God wants. I would also say it kind of manifests itself in wisdom. People start to make good decisions when God is working in their lives. We start to make, it starts to you know, affect our entire lives when God is working and we're letting him work and do and move in our lives, it's, it's really it's amazing to see. I would say there's a steadiness that comes as a result of just him being involved in these things. I mean, we could go on and on, right? But when God is working and moving in a person's life, we would just summarize it in this way. We would say it, 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 it looks like God. It looks like he's doing something. It looks like it's more than you, right? Like we know you, <laughs> we, we, we understand people, we know we're not faithful, we know we're not wise, we know we're not good, we know we're not smart. We start to see God working and moving. We go, man, God's moving in that person's life. And it's beautiful to see it. I love it. It's so encouraging. I will say, you know, the whole God works in mysterious ways thing is is correct in, in one way. We often do not see the Lord working at the time. I don't know about you. It's hard for me. Anybody else? It's hard to see him in the moment sometimes. So we have another phrase for that, right? We say hindsight is twenty twenty. We look back and we go, oh, there you are, right? There you were, God. I, I, I can see it so clearly now, but at the time it's like, man, it just felt like the job loss was all-consuming. It just felt like the injury or the sickness or it felt like whatever it was just con completely consumed. I couldn't see the Lord in and through it. Hindsight. We, listen, one of the things that we should do as people is we should often stop and reflect on what God has done. I don't know if this is a discipline for you, but it should be. You should stop and reflect on what God has done. It should be a regular discipline of our lives to remind ourselves of what God has done and who God is. Well, when we come to chapter 9 this morning, it's exactly what we come to. This is what the people are doing. They are stopping to reflect on what God has done and who he is. And please hear this because we're going to look at 
um, uh, after the initial part, we're going to look at a, a bunch of Israel's history. And you're going to think, what does Israel's history have to do with me? And the answer is everything. And the reason for this is because this is not just how God worked in their lives. you got to understand, this is who God is. What this means for you and I is that the same God who did these incredible things in their lives is the same God who the Bible says is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. You lifted hands this morning to the same God that parted the Red Sea. You lifted hands this morning in worship of the same God who put the earth and the planets and the universe into its orbit and holds it all by his power. You are lifting holy hands to the same God. And these things are meant to remind us of who he is, not just what he did, but who he is in our lives. He does the same thing in our lives if we will allow him to. So this morning, just so you understand how we'll move through this, we're going to move a little bit slowly through verses 1 through 5. We'll look at it more carefully, and then we'll move pretty quickly through the remainder of the chapter, okay? So we'll pick up speed a lot there, okay? And uh, let me remind you before we jump in, chapter 8, it ended with the people gathered in repentance over sin. They were weeping, they were mourning, and then their leaders came to them and said, okay, no more weeping, no more mourning. We want you now to celebrate the goodness of God. We want you to rejoice and remind yourselves, we want you to celebrate the Feast of Booths, Feast of Tabernacles or Feast of Booths. And that's where they would make themselves a little hut out in the wilderness somewhere or out in their courtyard with sticks and branches, no roof on it, and they would sleep out there Sounds awful for my back. But they would sleep out there looking up at the stars and reminding themselves of how God delivered them out of Egypt and sustained them all through the wilderness. Okay? So the people, as we come to chapter 9, that's what they've done. They've spent the week reminding themselves of the goodness of God, sleeping out under the stars. As we come to chapter 9, the people immediately come back. They gather back together in repentance and mourning. Watch this, verse 1. Now, on the 24th day of this month, the children of Israel were assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dust on their heads. So here they are. The nation is once again gathered together, and again, they are gathering in repentance over their sin. It says, first of all, that they are fasting. It means that they're not eating. And this is a a sign of their their deep spiritual need. That's what fasting is. You want to know what fasting is? Fasting is this. My need is not physical. My need is spiritual. That's what fasting is. That's how simple it is. I don't need food. I need spiritually. I need to change. So the people are fasting. It says then also that they are wearing sackcloth or burlap. It means they're not wearing anything comfortable. They're wearing burlap as their clothing, and this was a symbol of their sinfulness. And then it says they have dirt on their heads. It means they reached down, grabbed a pile of dirt, and just plopped right on the head, you know? And you're like, that's weird. Why'd they do that? They did it because it was a reminder that they are dirt apart from the Lord. They're nothing apart from Him. Some of us try to live our lives apart from the Lord. Guess what you are apart from the Lord? Dirt. You just dirt. You ain't accomplishing anything because the Bible says, apart from me, you accomplish nothing. You're just dirt apart from the Lord. This was the reminder. It was humility. They were reminding themselves, we're nothing apart from you. Nothing. So here's where they are, right? And you might say, wait a minute, I thought the people already repented. Why are they doing this again? Why are they they there repenting again? I thought they already did this. And I would say this. Number one, I think their week-long, you know, their week-long remembrance of God and his goodness, I think it actually did something. It caused them to, it pushed them even further into repentance. Uh, it led to the realization of how far they had strayed from God. And and I have often found this to be the case. The closer I get to the Lord, the more I realize how far I've been. How about you? You get near the Lord and you feel more sinful. And you're like, man, every time I get closer to him, I feel like I'm further from him. Then I need to get closer. 
Listen, that's what it's like, right? I've, I've often found this to be the case. I get close to him, the more I see my sin. That's because of how holy he is. Uh, the, the, the more I see my need for him, the closer I get to him. So it can be kind of painful. Maybe it is for you today. Maybe you've been drawing near the Lord. The Bible says, as you draw near to him, he draws near to you. And maybe that's been a painful process to you. The Lord's been revealing your selfishness. That's what the Lord's been revealing so much in me. My selfishness, my pride, my sinful thoughts, my arrogance, right? My rebellion to God. God reveals these things. As I get nearer to him, it's painful. But man, is it necessary it's so important, right? You start to see these rotten things in yourself. I would just encourage you, listen, let it do for you what it was doing for them. Let it drive you closer to the Lord and not away from him. Let it drive you into the Lord. You're like, man, I keep going to the Lord and, and there's so much I need to repent of. And listen, folks, I feel like I'm repenting to the Lord more now than ever. I've been following him now for 27 years. And I feel like I, I repent more now than ever. But listen, what he's doing is he reveals those things so that he can heal it. Right? It might be hard to see it. It might be hard to deal with it. But healing is happening. Now, there's something else that's happening here, and that's this. It's the reminder that repentance is not just a one and done thing. There's a weird, uh, it's not even Christian, but it, it, it's, it's a doctrine that is spread within the church I've heard before, which says that you only need to repent one time. Right? When you come to Jesus, that's it. You just repent the one time, and then all past, present, and future sins are forgiven. That is true when we talk about position in Christ. All of our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, but it is not true in practice. In practice, we as Christians, please hear me, we are people who repent. That's what we do. We are the people who repent. In fact, the world, the unsaved world, does not. The unsaved world refuses to feel bad and repent about these things, and, and thus they are unsaved. If they would repent to God, they would be saved, but they refuse to. No, no, you and I, we are the people who have repented to God, but please hear me, we are the people who do repent to God. Okay? This is to be we are to be as sensitive to sin as humanly possible. We are to be more and more sensitive to sin in our lives every single day. We are to be more sensitive. Listen, if we are in Christ, the Bible says our conscience is now alive, which means we are to feel when we do what is wrong. And that pain is designed to lead us to repentance. In fact, if we are not repentant people, there's something wrong. The Bible actually says we can become people who don't feel anymore. We don't feel wrong anymore. That sin, that's one of the things sin does, is it numbs us to God. It makes us so we don't feel those things anymore, which means we don't repent anymore. That's a real problem. Our hearts become like stones. We don't feel anything anymore. That's a real problem. And it can happen to me. It can happen to you. All we have to do is ignore the Lord. Well, hear, hear this, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's God's promise to you. If you will confess, he will forgive. And the result of that cleansing is holiness and happiness. It's the way forward. Now, notice what else they did. It's another true mark of repentance, verse 2. Then those of Israelite lineage separated themselves from all foreigners. So what they do here is symbolic of separating themselves from sin. God had told the nation of Israel, not all nations, okay, this is not a rule for everybody. This was a rule for the nation of Israel that they were not to merge with the nations around them. They were not to, to marry the nations around them and adopt their practices and merge their cultures and religions and everything. They ignored that, and they did that. And so um, uh, for them now to separate themselves from these things was to sort of hit the reset button. It was repentance. It's one of the three components of true repentance. It is to turn from sin. And I would ask you to just consider for a moment today, what would God want you to separate yourself from? What would he want you 
to separate yourself from. The Lord always wants us to separate ourselves from evil. And so I, I've seen this as a pastor. I've watched this. Some people, they want things to be different in their lives. They want things to change. They want things to be better. Um, but they are unwilling to separate themselves from the things that they have been involved in. Right? So some examples, right? I, I want to I wanna stop the problems that drinking is causing my life. But I don't want to pour it out. I want to stop the death that pornography just pours into my soul, killing everything around me, but I, but I can't do without my smartphone. I want to stop the problems of this relationship or that thing in my life and in my family and in my marriage, but I can't just cut that person off. We could go on and on and on, right? But nothing changes if nothing changes. And these people understood this. We have to separate ourselves now from these things. And here they are, they take the essential step in true repentance, and that is to separate themselves from the thing that they're repenting of. Please hear me. It is not repentance if we will not separate ourselves from the thing we're repenting of. It's not repentance. It's regret. It's remorse, but it's not repentance. Repentance has to have the turning from that thing. It's the pouring out, it's the flip phone now, it's whatever, right? It's whatever it takes to separate ourselves from what is killing us. And so they do this, they separate themselves, verse 2 goes on. And they stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. I love this, the word confess there in Hebrew means to lay it out item by item. I love this. This shows how serious these people are about repentance. They are not offering up the sort of like, God, forgive me for everything prayer. You ever done that? God, bless everything and forgive me for everything. Amen. Like, I have three seconds to pray to God, so I'm going to just try and cover it all, you know? That's not the kind of prayer here. This is a line by line. This is, this, as they stand there, they are remembering their offenses before God one by one. Again, that's painful. And they are, they are laying each one out before the Lord. Lord, I have sinned. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness and healing. And man, this is beautiful to see. I want you to hear this, please. It is so beautiful. Real repentance is beautiful. I have seen it in so many of you. It is beautiful to see. When you aren't concealing it anymore, when you aren't blaming anybody anymore, when you aren't you know, trying to ignore it anymore, when you're done with all of that, and when you are just confessing your sin to God, man, it is beautiful to see. It's like cancer being cut out of somebody's body. It brings nothing but healing. It's beautiful. There is nothing cheap going on here. Nothing. This is real stuff. And the Lord is, is, is really changing these people. He's doing something. I want you to think about the vulnerability of all of them. They're standing there, and the way it's written, they're literally confessing their sins out loud together. They're just confessing. I'm wrong in this. I've done wickedness. I've done these things. James chapter 5, verse 16 tells us to do this. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Maybe you need to go to somebody today and be like, hey, listen, I have this issue. I need your help. I need your prayer because I'm in trouble. This is what they were doing. Now, notice once again where they actually turn for the help and healing, and that's the word of God according to verse 3. They stood up in their place and they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for one-fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshiped the Lord their God. I love it. They're just reading from the scriptures for half the day. The other half of the day, they're confessing their sin and they're worshiping the Lord. And so I thought, today we'll just do that, okay? We'll just, we'll just spend the rest of the day. We'll just, you are know, like, oh, I, I actually got to go. Um, Right? But I mean, think about it, right? All day long, they're just reading the scriptures, and then they're worshiping God and confession and beautiful. As a result of it, by the way, real things began to happen. Real change. Real men, real women, real families. People saved. Beautiful. Well, from there we read verse 4. It says, uh, then uh, a bunch of guys stood on the stairs of the Levites and cried out with a loud voice to the Lord their God. Verse 5, and the Levites, these are the priests, and then those guys, said, stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. 
right? So here they are right now. I mean, they're just like, okay, Israel, stand up and let's bless the Lord. So here, I'm going to ask you to stand up. I'm gimpy. Come on, stand up with me. Listen, don't, don't, talk to, don't talk to me. Don't talk to the person around you. Don't talk to the church. Talk to the Lord. We're going to bless the Lord together just like they did. Here's what they said. They said, blessed be your glorious name. Ready? Blessed be your glorious name. Then they said this, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Ready? Which is exalted above all blessing and praise. You can sit down. The congregation stands and blesses the Lord together. Beautiful. And then someone, we're not told who, probably Ezra, the priest, he begins a prayer in verse 6. And again, it's Israel's history, but it reminds us of how good the Lord is. And I would just encourage you to notice all the the you's. (laughs) You did this. You did this. You are good. You are faithful. You chose. You moved. You worked. I just encourage you to notice those and then notice the we, which is always like we did wickedly. We failed. We were unfaithful, right? Take a look. It begins verse 6. You alone are the Lord. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. Folks, let me remind you who is the Lord. It's him. Him and him alone. When you, when we do this, when we, this is a reset for us with what happened yesterday, with what's happening in our world, when we remind ourselves You alone are Lord. You have made everything. God, you made everything. The heaven of heavens, you made uh, all of the angels. You made the earth. You hold it all together, the sea and everything that's in it. God, you have made it all. You hold it all together. And even the angels of God worship him continually. It's a reminder to us to look to the Lord this morning and to remind ourselves of who we're talking to. It's the Lord. We're not talking to some, you know, man. We're talking to the Lord, the Lord God. Look at verse 7. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and gave him the name Abraham. You know, Abraham didn't find the Lord. The Lord found him, Genesis 11. He chose him and revealed himself to him and saved him and brought him out of that pagan land to know and, and, and follow the Lord God. And then the Lord changed Abram into the man we know who is Abraham, a man who knew and loved the Lord. You say, what am I supposed to learn from this? Ready? You're supposed to learn that God changes people. He changes people. He changes pagan, heathen, following people, Abrams, into Abrahams. I wonder what my new name is, because I know my name isn't Chuck in heaven, you know? <laughs> no way. There's no way Chuck is in heaven, you know what I mean? It's, it's got to be something way cooler than that, you know? You ain't going to find Chuck in the Bible, you know? You're gonna, like, it's got to be something good, right? My pre-knowing Jesus name is that. Okay, fine. But like, what's my new name, you know? God changes people, folks. That's, that's why we remind you of Abram to Abraham. You want to be a different person? Who are you talking to? Where are you looking? Barnes & Noble doesn't have a book for you. It's right here. It's the God of the Scriptures. Man, goes on, right? It says, uh, verse 8, you found his heart faithful. Before you, and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the flashlights, the termites, right? Like (laughs) all these guys, right? To give it to his descendants. Still at the kids' table here, it's fine. (laughs) Notice the words, right? You, uh, you made a covenant with him. I mean, this is astonishing. God made a promise to a man, made a promise to a person. That's crazy. God just picks you and says, I promise this is what I'm going to do for you. 
incredible. The Lord told Abraham in Genesis 15, I'm giving you the land, the land that we call today Israel, to you and your people, the Israelites, forever. I'm not making a political statement. Their land is theirs. The land belongs to Israel forever. God gave it to them. It was his decision, not ours. It doesn't belong to Palestine. It belongs to Israel, to the, to the Hebrew people. God gave it to them forever. If you have a problem with that, you just got to take it up with God because that's what he said, not me, what he said, right? So Ezra goes on and says, you, you gave us this land. You have performed your words for you are righteous. Can I hit the reset button for us really quickly about something? Listen, God does what he wants to. He does what he wants to do. And he, he does not need our approval or our consent to do it. He is God and we are not. And, and maybe you don't have trouble with this. But listen, some of us have to be reminded we're not God. And God does not need our approval to do whatever it is he decides to do. He'll do what he wants to do. And, and here's the thing, right? His wisdom is infinitely beyond our own. And when you couple God will do whatever he wants to do with this, that God cannot do wrong. God can never get it wrong. He can never make a mistake. He can never do what would be less than the best for you and I. God cannot make a mistake or fail, but God will do what he wants. That's a reset for us who sometimes get it wrong and forget that God doesn't answer to us. Now, if we have trouble with this, we just need to go back to verse 6, where shockingly, I could not find my name in the verse. Verse 6, look what it says, you alone are Lord, <laughs> right? You have made the heaven, uh, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and everything on it, the sea and all that is in them. You preserve them all. The host of heaven worships you. I, I didn't see my name there at all, did you? No. God doesn't answer to me. He doesn't answer to you. He doesn't answer to anybody else. He answers to himself, and he only does what is good and what is right. Well, from there, Ezra prays and worships the Lord for delivering the people from Egypt. Look what it says, verse 9. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. We could spend a lot of time here today. We don't have the time, but please know that God hears the cries of his people. He hears your cries even when no one else does. He sees you even when no one else does. Israel had no hope in Egypt Nobody was going to deliver them. Only God could do it. Only God heard their cries. Only God made a way. And his way was spectacular. Look what it says, verse 10 there. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh, against all his servants, and against all the people of his land. Of course, this reminds us of the ten plagues, right? Amazing what God did. But I would also remind you, there did not need to be ten plagues. It was The Lord did not want to crush the Egyptians. There were 10 plagues because of verse 10. The end of it, look what it says. For you knew that they acted proudly against them. Pharaoh and the Egyptians refused to be humbled before God. They would not do what God said, and thus there were the plagues. They didn't have to have any plagues, none of them. All they had to do was simply humble themselves before God and, and let God's people go. And there wouldn't have been any plagues, none. But they rejected God, they refused God, they refused to humble themselves, they refused to let God's people leave. And so the end of verse 10 says, so God did what God des desired to do. It says, you made a name for yourself as it is this day. God literally said, I will show you who is God and who is not. Now, the mistake that our own nation is making, our leaders are making, is this mistake, the mistake that Egypt made. It's the mistake that many nations and civilizations through history ha have made. It is an, an age-old classic mistake, and that's this, to act as though God is not there, to act as though God does not see the, the evil and the wickedness that is being done by individual people, to act as though God does not care what's being done, to act as though they will not have to answer to him is a tragic mistake because every person will stand before the Lord and give an account, every single person. And I cannot imagine those that have such blood on their hands 
having to stand before the Lord God who has seen everything. No media cover in this. No spin, but the Lord God unfolding all evil and wickedness and laying it out. That's coming. I wonder what plagues the Lord will allow in our world to make this truth clear. I am God and you are not. Verse 11 says, you divided the sea before them so that they went through the midst of the sea on dry land and their persecutors you threw into the deep as a stone into the mighty waters. I don't know about you, the parting of the Red Sea is wild. You think about this one thing, dry ground. I want you to think about how long it would take for the ocean floor to dry up. I mean, I'm talking just push the water back. How long does it take for it to dry up? Months? A year? They walked through on dry ground, not mud. They weren't slogging through in mud. Dry ground, folks. It's beyond comprehension. And then as soon as they were safely across, the Egyptians rush in after them, and God says, closed, and it's over. I mean... It's astonishing. And they're reminding themselves of these things. Verse 12, Moreover, you led them by day with a cloudy pillar and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the road with which they should travel. It's always been one of my favorite things God has done. There was literally a column of fire at night for the people so that they could see, so that they would be warm. It would be a warning to people who would want to attack them. There's a column of fire that moves, by the way, (laughs) <laughs> right? And then in the day, that column of fire would become a cloud over them so that two million plus people had, had shade in the middle of the desert. That's pretty awesome. How good is God? In both instances, when the, the cloud moved, the people moved. They were like, ooh, it's getting kind of hot. Let's, let's follow that, Right? And God led them. And then the pillar by night, when it moved, it was time to move. And God led them all over the place by these two things, the pillar of fire and the cloud by day, because God is good. It goes on, right? But, But before it does, let me remind you, you say, what am I supposed to learn from this? God will lead your life if you let him. If you want to lead your life, he'll let you. But if you'll let him lead your life, he'll do it. That's what you're supposed to learn from verse 12. Ezra goes on, verse 13. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them your precepts, statutes and laws by the hand of Moses, your servant. Of course, this is referring to the giving of the Ten Commandments, the law on Mount Sinai. God came, he shrouded the mountain in his glory and came to that mountain, spoke to Moses and gave him the truth. Two million people waiting down at the base of this mountain, waiting for Moses to return. Certain needs arose in the desert. Wonder what those could be. Well, food and water. Look at verse 15. You gave them bread from heaven for their, for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst. Man, manna from heaven, and water out of the solid rock. I want you to think about this for a moment. For 40 years, God rained pita bread out of the sky. Okay? Pita bread fell out of the sky, and I want you to think about this. For 2 million plus people to eat all day long, okay? Every day, six days a week. On the sixth day, he provided enough for the seventh day. Six days a week, For 40 years. That's wild. And that is the goodness of God. And then not only that, the people need water, right? So everywhere they go, the bread falls. In the morning, it's waiting for them. And then also everywhere they go, a rock opens up somewhere. And it's not some little trickle where everybody's got to try and like, you know, scoop it up with their hands, you know, this little tiny... A river flows out because you need two million plus people, all their animals, everybody's got to eat. You know what I'm saying? Everybody's got to drink. So a river opens up everywhere they go in the absolute desert. I just want you to think about this. 
You're walking along. God says, okay, we stop here. There's like one rock. It's sitting right there. You're like, where's the water? And all of a sudden, and then a river just starts flowing out of this thing. You're like checking behind it like, where's the hose? (laughs) This is what God did for them. The New Testament says that rock followed them all through the wilderness. Not really, but it's saying everywhere they went, the water, the rock opened up and the water flowed. Incredible. God did that. God. Man has never even come close to anything like this, right? God did this. Now, when they arrived at their land that he was given to them, look at verse 15, he told them to go in and possess the land which you had sworn to give them, but they and our fathers acted proudly. Notice that they acted proudly. They hardened their necks and did not heed your commandments. So God brought the people to the edge of their land. He told them to go into it and take it. There were people in the land. He told them to go in and take it, but they rebelled against him and they refused. As a result of that, nobody entered God's uh, 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 promised land for a long time. And folks, this is what rebellion against God looks like. It looks like pride. That's how it begins. It's arrogance. It's zero humility. And and then that that leads to a refusal to turn from God's path. See the words there, harden their necks? What does that mean? It means they did this. It's like, no, no, turn. Like, turn, turn around. Stop going that way. Turn from that direction. It literally means... You're trying to help somebody to go the other direction, but they refuse to to be turned. That's what they did. And that's what we are like, isn't it? My hand is in the air, right? That is what I am like. Stubborn, stiff-necked. God can't turn me, right? That's what that is. It it is to to allow myself to become uncorrectable. And the result is, then you don't heed God's commands, So some of us, we're not following the Lord, we're not doing what he wants, and it's because we are uncorrectable, and the root of that is pride. We don't think we need the Lord. So verse 17 says it, they refused to obey. They knew what it was, but they refused it. And they were not mindful of your wonders that you did among them, but they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion, they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. One of the most tragic aspects of pride is that it causes us to forget about the Lord. We we forget, we don't even think about him. We don't think about what he's done. We don't think about who he is. We don't think about what he wants. We ignore God. How tragic and foolish is that? But listen, here's the amazing thing. All of this is not just that God is holy and just and we are wicked and righteous. Please hear this. God is also merciful and full of kindness. Look at verse 17. But you, please notice, we're talking about God. But you are God, ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and you did not forsake them. Here's our God, ready? He is absolutely perfectly holy, perfectly just, the sinless judge of all the earth. Every person will have to stand before this judge. He sees everything. He is infinitely powerful. He does what he wants to do when he wants to. The mountains and and oceans flee before him. I mean, yes, right? He is God. He knows all things. He is unchanging. He can't do wrong. All of that is true. But alongside of that, ready? He is also merciful and gracious, and compassionate. He is also ready to forgive. Man, this is incredible. The word ready to pardon, that's what it means, is to forgive. And I I don't know who needs to hear this this morning, but God is ready to forgive you. He's ready to, but you are holding him back. If God is ready to forgive then why isn't it happening? See, sometimes we think we have to pay for it for a while. We think i got to put myself through some stuff so that I can be worthy of forgiveness. That's not how it works. Our Lord Jesus came and he died in our place. We are not worthy. We never will be. Some of us, listen, God is, he's waiting on you. He's ready. Are you ready to turn to him in repentance and say, God, okay, 
I need your forgiveness. Because listen, he's ready to pardon, and it also says he's gracious, and it means that he is ready to give you what you do not deserve. That's what grace is. I don't deserve it, but that's what God gives. He gives what we do not deserve. Kindness and compassion to those that do not deserve that, but instead, my hand is up, deserve judgment and wrath and and hell. That's what I deserve. Do you feel unworthy of God's forgiveness this morning? Unworthy of his kindness? Good. You're in a good place. Turn to him. That's his specialty. In fact, he resists those that think they have no need. It says there he's also merciful. It says there he's slow to anger. He's abundant in kindness. And because of that, he did not forsake them. This is his incredible kindness on display. And, and, and in verse 18, there is an awful event that took place, and it shows the kindness of God. Look at this awful event in verse 18. I mean, we, I don't even understand if we understand how bad this was. But verse 18, even when they made a molded calf for themselves and said, this is your God that brought you out of Egypt and worked great provocations. Listen, while, the, while Moses was on the mountain and God was meeting with him and giving him the law, the people down below gave their gold to Aaron, told him to make a, a golden cow, which is something that was worshipped in Egypt. They set this thing up, and the people, listen, they didn't just dance. They didn't just party. It was sexual debauchery of every imaginable form. It was, it was awful. That's why it says there are great provocations against the Lord. The Lord should have wiped them literally off the face of the earth, and he did not do that. He did not do that. They danced around that thing and said, worship your God who brought you out of Egypt. What an offense to God. But God was merciful to them. He did not annihilate them. He did not turn his back on them. Verse 19, yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of cloud did not even depart by day to lead them on the road, nor to the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way that they should go. You also gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. God wasn't trying to kill them. All he would have had to do was stop the bread, stop the water. He didn't. Bread came the very next morning. Water flowed the very next day. The pillar still there protecting the clouds, still over them. And here's what I would say. What are we supposed to learn from this? In your rebellion to God, has he not still been good to you? Has he not still taken care of you? Has God not proven himself to be faithful when you are unfaithful, when I am unfaithful? Has God not proven himself over and over what the Bible says that even when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny who he is? Has God not shown that he is good even when we are not? What are we supposed to learn from this? That God is good. That he is faithful. He is not as we expect him to be. His ways are beyond our ways. If you think God hates you today, you are wrong. You are wrong. If you think God's done with you today, you're wrong. If you think he's forsaken you today, you're wrong. If you think he will not receive you, you're wrong. He will receive you. Turn to him. Now listen, did their sin and rebellion destroy their lives? Yes, of course it did. Sin always does this. It causes so much damage. You can't light a house on fire and think that the house is going to be fine. But God did not turn his back on them. He did not forsake them, and God remained good to them. Verse 21, for 40 years, you sustained them in the wilderness. They lacked nothing. Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. I mean, think about this. Their clothing did not, it wasn't like a, it wasn't like a old navy in the middle of the, Israeli desert, you know? Nothing wore out. Their their sandals did not wear out. Their clothing, God took care of them. Incredible. Incredible. Well, verse 22 through 25, look what it says, the goodness of the Lord. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided them into districts. So they took possession of the land of Sihon, the land of the king of Heshbon, and the land of Og, king of Bashan. You also multiplied their children as the stars of heaven and brought them into the land which you, told, which you had told their fathers to go in and possess. So the people went in and possessed the land. 
you subdued before them the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, and gave them into their hands with their kings and and the people of the land, that they might do with them as they wish. And they took strong cities and a rich land and possessed houses full of goods, cisterns that were already dug, vineyards, olive groves, and fruit trees in abundance. So they ate and were filled and grew fat and delighted themselves in your great goodness. God blessed them. He blessed them. And you read their story and it's like, man, God would have given, I would have given up on these people. I would have given up on me. God does not. He blessed them because God is good. I don't deserve it. Rod, do you deserve it? I don't deserve it. But God is good. That's his grace. That's his mercy. There's a danger in prosperity. When things are going well, we can forget the Lord. That's what happened in verse 26. It says, Nevertheless, they were disobedient. They rebelled against you, cast your law behind their backs, and killed your prophets who testified against them to turn them to yourself, and they worked great provocations. It's literally, they took God's word and they threw it behind their back. They said, we don't need that. What would be the equivalent of that today? I never read God's word. Don't need it. Don't need it. That's what they did. I, I, we don't need it. We, we, I don't care what God wants. I don't care what God thinks. I don't care what, what God says. I, I'm doing my thing, man. And I got my religion. Just leave me alone. No, you don't. You have a path straight to hell. That's, that's, what, that's what that is, right? God's word. God, in his word, that's how we know him. That's how we know truth. You cannot get rid of this and think you follow him. You don't. You don't follow him. If if you're not in this, you're not following him. You cannot throw his word behind yourself. He sent prophets to them to warn them. And in every instance, the prophet went to them with one purpose. It was says there to turn them to the Lord. These prophets spoke for the Lord. It was God wanting them to turn from their wickedness and back to him. But, but here's what they did. They did what so many do with truth. They silenced the truth. They thought if we kill the prophets, they can't tell us anything anymore. And God sent prophet after prophet to tell the people what was true. But wicked people, please hear me, wicked people hate truth. You know this, right? Wicked people hate truth. When people are in rebellion, when they're doing wickedly, They don't want to hear the truth. That's why they hate you. That's why they turn against you. They're not turning against you. They're turning against the truth. They don't want to hear it. Maybe today, maybe you're here and you're like, I don't want to hear it. That is because you're in rebellion to God. That is because you and God are not right. You see, Jesus said it this way. Everyone who practices evil hates the light, hates the truth, and does not come to the light or to the truth lest his deed should be exposed. This is why when a person is involved in wickedness, they don't want to hear God's word. They don't want to hear truth because it exposes them. And so they tried to avoid truth. But but please hear me. Please, please hear this. If you reject truth, see, God God has written it on your heart, the Bible says. So you have to push against that. And if you do that, if you push against the truth that God has written on your heart, his law on your heart, if you push against that, God will send people to you. Please hear me. He will send people to you to warn you. Hey, you're going the wrong direction. Hey, this is not right. you got to turn. He'll send people to you. If you reject them, please hear me, the next thing that happens is terrifying. Here's what happens. God says, okay. You can do what you want to do. Let me tell you something. You do not want God to ever let you do what you want to do. You don't want that. It will eat you up and spit you out. But that's where God gets to. When you reject the internal, the Holy Spirit, trying to draw you to repentance, when you refuse that, and then you refuse the people God sends to you, maybe this morning, What I'm saying to you, God's trying to say to you, turn, turn, and you refuse that, the next thing is for God to say, okay, have at it. 
And you go, well, that's mean. No, it's not. God is trying to crush you so that you will turn to him. He lets your sin do what your sin will do to you. It will, it will crush you. But here's the hope, that in your crushed state, crushed of your pride, crushed of your power, crushed of your promises, crushed of all these things, you'll turn to the Lord finally and God can heal. But man, I've watched this. I have watched this so many times. God says, okay. By the way, it's, it's one of the things that I have to do as a pastor. I have to look at people and say, you cannot come to the church anymore. I say, why would you ever do that? Because it's what's best for them. You say, what does that accomplish? It accomplishes what God is saying. There are times we are supposed to turn away from someone who names themselves as a Christian, who is involved in unrepentant sin. We are supposed to look at that person and say, we love you, we can't have anything to do with you. You want it? Go have it. Let it beat you to death. It's going to. And we'll be here when you're ready to repent and turn. We'll be here. And, and God does this. Maybe today you've been turned over to sin because you've rejected all of God's warnings and all the people he sent to you. The goal for, for, for him is for you today. You can stop all of it. You can turn to the Lord today in repentance and healing. He loves you, and he will heal you. He will. Well, look what happens when they turn 27. It says there, in, in their time of trouble, when they cried to you, you heard from heaven, and according to your abundant mercies, you gave them deliverers who saved them. It's referring to the judges, uh, them from the hand of their enemies. But something happened, verse 28, but after they had some rest, they again did evil before you, therefore you left them in the, in the hand of their enemies so that they had dominion over them. I've seen this as a pastor over the years so many times. When everything blows up in your life, when, people, when, when stuff happens in your life, everybody is like, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? You know, It's like, my house is on fire. What do I do to put the house out? What do I, what do I, anything I need to do, pastor, whatever it is, just tell me, I'll do it. I am so willing. Counseling, help, this thing, make this change. I'm, I'm in, I'm gonna do it. I gotta put the fire out. You know, something happens, right? Eventually the fire goes out. And then you got to start rebuilding things. You got to start tearing out the burned stuff, and you got to start building again, and you got to start protecting again. And that's tough. That's hard. And guess what happens? A lot of times people go, eh, the fire's out. It's no big deal. Go back to what I was doing, go back to the way that things were. Uh, I, know, I know pornography nearly destroyed my entire life, but, and I made a good decision. I, I went and got a flip phone, and, and, uh, and, I, and I started doing some accountability software, and, and I started meeting with different people, but, you know, that was, that was like a year ago, man. I can trust myself with that phone again. So you're going to just go right back to uh, the same thing then and think that it's going to not consume your life. Okay. I don't have to cut alcohol out forever. Let's not get crazy. I don't have to be careful of these things anymore. Now that I've had some rest, I should be okay. It was the mistake they made. We've had some rest. Right back at it. And I've seen this so many times. No more willingness. No more urgency. And all the fruit that was being born from the urgency and from doing what God said is gone because there's no more of that. So verse 28 continues, yet when they returned, so they did, it's just this pattern back and forth, when they returned and cried to you, you heard from heaven. It says they did this over and over. And many times you delivered them according to your mercies. Testified against them. that You might bring them back to your law. Over and over, verse 29, yet they acted proudly. And did not heed your commandments, but sinned against your judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Watch this. And they shrugged their shoulders, stiffened their necks, and would not hear. You say, what does that mean? It means, who cares? This is always a scary place when I'm talking to somebody, and it does not seem like it matters at all. I look at somebody, I say, man, you are going to burn your life to the ground. You've got to turn. And they just sort of go, I mean, they don't do that, but inwardly, that's all they're doing. Okay, 
You go, people really get there? Oh, yeah, yeah. So easy to get there. Shrug the shoulders. Hey, man, you're going to burn your marriage to the ground. Hey, you're going to destroy your lives, your, your children, the kids in your life. You're going to destroy them. Hey, you're going to eat your life up in uselessness. It's hard to watch, and I watch it all the time. It's so hard to watch. It's crazy. It's painful. Stiff-necked. They would not hear, it says. They would not hear. Just don't care. But God's faithfulness again, verse 30. Yet for many years you had patience with them testified against them by your spirit and your prophets, yet they would not listen. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of the people of the land. Nevertheless, in your great mercy, you did not utterly consume them nor forsake them, for you are God, gracious and merciful. Then Ezra begins to repent, verse 32. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and awesome God, who keeps covenant and mercy, do not let all the trouble seem small before you that has come upon us. Our kings and our princes, our priests and our prophets, our fathers and all your people from the days of the kings of Assyria until this day. However, watch this, you are just in, in all that has befallen us. You have dealt faithfully, but we have done wickedly. Neither our kings nor our princes, our priests nor our fathers have kept your law, nor heeded your commandments and your testimonies with which you testified against them. Ezra's prayer is a model prayer. It essentially says, I'm the problem. I'm not blaming anybody else anymore. I deserve judgment, we deserve judgment, but listen, watch this, he's asking God for his mercy. And folks, it's not wrong to do that. It's not wrong to humble yourself and ask God for his forgiveness, ask God for his mercy. That is not wrong to do. If you know anything about the Lord, you know that's what he wants you to do. He doesn't want you to self-afflict till you feel worthy of repentance. He wants you to repent. Repent because he wants to forgive. He's ready to forgive. And so as we close out the chapter, it says there, verse 35, for they have not served you in their kingdom or in the many good things that you gave them or in the land, uh, or excuse me, in the large and rich land which you set before them, nor do they turn from their wicked works. Ezra says, here we are, your servants today, in the land that you gave to our fathers to eat its fruit and its bounty. Here we are, servants in it meaning they're serving the nations around them, and it yields much increase to the kings you've set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle at their pleasure, and we are in great distress. Long story short, God had blessed them, but because of their sin, all the nations around them were the ones that were benefiting from it, not them. They were slaves. They were in bondage because of sin, and that's what sin always does. So verse 38, because of all this, we make a sure covenant and write it. Our leaders, our Levites, and our priests seal it. So here's what they do. They say, we are making a covenant with you, God, today. We are going to follow you from this point forward. We're going to to return to you, Lord. In chapter 10, all the people are going to come, and they're going to sign this, this covenant. God, we return to you. And what I would say to you this morning is just simply this. What about you? What about me, right? God is ready to pardon. He's ready. Are you ready? God is ready to forgive. He is gracious. He is merciful. He's slow to anger. He is abundant in kindness. Will you turn to him and allow him? Maybe you don't know the Lord today. Turn to the Lord. He loves you. Maybe you know him, but you've been in rebellion to him. You've got to turn in repentance today. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. We thank you for being who you are, ready to forgive. Lord, I pray for any person watching or here today that needs salvation, that they would very simply right now turn to you. If that's you, you need salvation, turn to the Lord. Admit, as they did, admit that you are the sinner, that you need salvation, and ask him to be merciful to you. He will. Maybe today you're here and you know the Lord and been in rebellion to him, you've been uncaring, you've thrown his word over your shoulder to not care, ask God to heal you. Come to him in repentance today, he will heal. 
Lord, we thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Please do your good work in us. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, church, listen, if we can pray for you for any reason at all, some of our deacons will be up here in the front just waiting, ready to pray with you. Myself, my wife will be back there in the back ready to pray with you. If you don't have a Bible, stop by the guest service table and pick up a Bible, okay? Let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord.